Um, we have two presenters in this session. They each have 20 minutes um, for their presentations. Our speakers today in order are Rosie Stevenson Goodnight from Northeastern University. Uh, since 2017, Rosie has served as the Wiki Visiting Scholar at the Northeastern University's Libraries Digital Scholarship Group Women Writers Project. Uh, Rosie is the co-founder of the Women in Red Project and was named as Wikipedian of the Year in 2016 and knighted in Serbia in 2018 because of her Wikipedia work. Uh, Rosie is a fabulous speaker and person and I am inspired by her every day. So Rosie, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Well, thank you so much for that introduction, Mary Lee. And I want to thank all the LD4 conference organizers for including me in the program. And a thank you to you, the audience, for joining me today as I present on my project, Women Writers in Review, Integrating Special Collections into Wikidata, a linked open data project. All right, so Women Writers in Review at Northeastern University is a long-term research project. It's devoted to early modern women's writing and electronic text encoding. The goal is to bring texts by pre-Victorian women writers out of the archive and make them accessible to a wide audience. Women Writers in Review is part of a bigger initiative called Women Writers Online. Women Writers Online includes 390 English language texts written, translated by, or attributed to women, primarily print texts that were first published between 1526 and 1850. The Women Writers in Review project at Northeastern University be began in January 2011 and was completed in December 2015. Its central motivation was the question, what can we learn about the readership and reception of women's writing for a collection of this scale? And how do we go about framing that research? The results are an extensive and growing body of data on readership and reception, including the development of metadata and bibliographic data records for periodical reviews of women's writing and collaborative research on reception, as well as the development of interfaces and integration with women writers online. The central focus of women writers on, uh, in review is the cultures of reception. These are 690 English language texts responding to works written or translated by women. These include literary and theatrical reviews, publication notices, textual extracts. They were published between 1770 and 1830. They are TEI encoded and published through the Women Writers in Review interface. Encoded texts tend to be brief. They represent a constrained set of genres and publication dates. The evaluations in cultures of reception are tagged and they run from very positive to very negative. These visualizations that you see here are from the Northeastern University webpage, which show the variations in individual authors' reception over time. In this illustration, the positive evaluations are dark green, the negative are dark red, and so forth. There are several types of bibliographic information in this data set. There are the reviews, there are the sources, for example, historical periodicals and books, and there are the works or reference works, which are distinct textual creations which are referenced in the reviews. There are more than 600 of these reviews, 74 authors, 198 reference works, 113 sources. There are hundreds of tags, 
eight different categories of genre tags, totaling 668 just in this alone. Five different categories of format tags, six different categories of reception tags, 14 different categories of theme tags, three different categories of miscellaneous tags. And then there's the data about the review itself, the title and author, the reviewer, if, it, if that was known, the title of the venue or the periodical or the book in which the review was published. For periodicals, there's the volume, the issue, the date, the page range. These are all captured as distinct fields. And then a pointer to where the work was being reviewed. There's data about the work being reviewed. There's data about the title, including a short title, a full title, the author, the editor, if relevant, the publisher and publication location, the edition, if relevant, the year of publication, collection in which the work appeared, if relevant, the length of the work in pages. And then there are the people, the editors, the authors, the reviewers. There are a lot of challenges that were faced by Northeast University in putting this project together, such as the relative obscurity of the materials, both in the likelihood that readers would look for individual reviews and in their authorship and their titles. There's a need for context to make these reviews useful. And then there's the linking between everything, the visualizations, the, the um, desire to make browsing and search be easy, the supporting discovery and exploration, and then a clean and readable display. I joined the Women Writers Project at Northeastern University in 2017, first as a Wikipedia visiting scholar through the Wiki Education Foundation. I'm supported in my work by Amanda Rust at Northeastern University. I hope you're out there in the audience, Amanda, and can help me with questions when we're done with this. And other folks like Ryan McGrady and Will Kent at the Wiki Education Foundation. For the first two years in my role, I focus on writing Wikipedia articles, biographies and articles about women's works, specifically transatlantic English language women writers. So not Australia, not New Zealand, for example. As a remote community member of Northeastern University, I have access to library resources. I cannot be successful in writing these Wikipedia articles without the access to library resources because of the paywall issues that most Wikipedians face. I created or improved 517 biographies of women writers born between the period of 1505 and 1879, as well as articles about their works. I've been thinking about the Women Writers in Review collection since I started my position in March 2017. I thought it might be a good candidate to import into Wikidata, but for the first two years, I couldn't sort out the methodology. In November 2018, I had hallway conversations with people during the Wikisite conference in Berkeley, California. Everyone I discussed this project with thought such that it sounded interesting but no one was aware if anything similar had been done before in Wikidata. They couldn't point me to a Wikidata project I could use as a go-by. At the May 2019 LD4 conference, I presented a short session on Women Writers in Review. How I thought about your methodology, the new property I thought I would need, and so forth. And when I was done with my session and for the next couple of days, I had very resoundingly positive feedback. It was my green light, if you will, to move forward and just sort things out. I started with a spreadsheet. I looked closely to see what was already in Wikidata, knowing that most of the Northeastern University data would need to be added. But for example, some of the authors were already in Wikidata. I started adding some items by hand, mainly the authors, and several people 
um, helped me. They imported different parts of the API, the uh, Northeastern University API, for me over the course of six months or so. As much as this was helpful, it always needed to be cleaned up. The basic framework of how you'll see the items depicted in Wikidata is here. Every author from the Northeastern University collection needs a Wikidata item. Each of her reference works, the plays, the essays, the novels, and so forth, in the Northeastern University collection needs a Wikidata item. And then, of course, there's linkage. Authors and their works are linked, and so forth. Reception items, that is, the reviews, the publication notices, the advertisements, and other documents responding to or discussing text by, text by women need a Wikidata item. Every review article in those source periodicals needs a Wikidata item. And every review article has been evaluated by Northeastern University academics. And this evaluation, it too gets a Wikidata item. The imports and additions have to be done in sequence as the data needs to be linked. What links everything together in this project on Wikidata is the statement described by source equals women writers in review. It was abundantly clear to me that Wikidata lacked a key property for this project. And with the help of Will Kent, I created a property proposal for review of, which was ultimately approved. I worked on the project from May 2019 until February 2020, when the pandemic came and my focus shifted to other wiki work relevant for this era. But I expect to return to my wiki data work in the coming months. All right then, let's look at a completed string. It starts with an author, and in this case, Hannah Cowley. Here is how she is depicted on the NEU website. This is just the top of that web page. And now we look at the top of her Wikidata item. And scrolling down that page, you'll see her image, her gender, the image is imported from Wikimedia Commons. The country of citizenship, in this case, you can see there are two listed. Birth name, given name, family name, pseudonym, date of birth, place of birth, date of death. The flags you see within some of the statements reflect a need for a reference. And in this case, you see they're missing. It says zero references. This is but one example that there is more work to be done on all of these items. Her writing languages, her occupations, and what she is a member of. Hannah Cowley has a long list of notable works. Each of these works, of course, has its own Wikidata item. This is just a part of the list. I spoke earlier about the statement described by source equals women writers in review, and you will find this in every item associated with the collection. Scrolling still further down the page, you can see Hannah Cowley's item has a lot of identifiers. Try to squeeze them all in here. In addition, her Wikidata item includes this information, such as the image again from Wikicommons, links to her biography in six different language Wikipedias, and so forth. All right. Let's turn our attention now to the depiction of a written work. Here's the header on the Northeastern University website. And here you see the top of the Wikidata item. Inception, title, subtitle, main subjects, genre has addition or translation, the author name, the place of publication, the language of work or name. 
the publication date, the narrative location, the number of pages, the copyright status. And again, that all too, all very familiar uh, statement now described by source and women writers in review. You can see the URL always also, and you can see what the, it is actually called on the Northeastern University website, which might be different than what is um, noted in Wikidata. And then at the bottom, the identifiers associated. Let's take a look next at the reviewed source. In this case, it's a periodical. Here's the header on the Northeastern University website. And here's the top of the Wikidata item. And as we scroll down the page, you see things like title and the main subject and the country of origin and the discontinued date and then the familiar described by source, women writers in review, and also identifiers. Next, let's look at a sources or a periodicals review of a reference work. Here's um, actually in the sidebar of what you'll see on the Northeastern University page. And the top of the Wikidata item, you'll see it includes things like title and main subject and genre, author name string, and we use this when the author's name is unknown, so we don't know who back in uh, 1796 did the actual review in this case. The place of publication, the language of the work, you'll see um, all the data about where this particular article, which might have been just two sentences, where it was published, including the volume, the pages, the publication date, and in this case, there are two references to that, and then again, the familiar described by source. And now this brings us to the scholarly evaluation. What happened in um, very recent years at Northeastern University. What do the academics do? Here we see uh, what you would see on the top of the page at Northeastern University. And here you see the top of the um, actual Wikidata item. And you see then there's the title and the main subject in the genre and the author name string again. And where it was published and described by source and where it was reviewed. The completion status of the work is as follows. 100% of the authors are entered into Wikidata but each of these items still needs to be reviewed for cleanup and for what's missing, such as certain statements require references and some additional tags and so forth. 100% of the written works and 100% of the reception items, the periodicals, if you will, are entered. But the same point is true regarding review and data cleanup. 9% of the literary reviews are entered. 1% of the scholarly evaluations are entered. And I don't have an estimate on the completeness of the thousands of texts. It is also appropriate to say that everything is still under construction. Some of the representations are better formed than others. The structure seems valid but that's to open verification. Validity checks, linkage inconsistencies, all on the to-do list. So what's next? How do we deal with evaluation? What value is there in this work, in this integration from an existing special collection? How well did we do it or did I do it? Have we been able to learn more about the collection through its presence on Wikidata? Is the Wikidata visualization better? 
Will anyone else out there who has a special collection that's similar in style to this one want to replicate the methodology? And if so, how will the data compare? The thing about Wikidata is that anyone can edit it. And how will this affect the Wikidata depiction of the collection? The second link is to the project page on Wikidata, and there you'll see elements such as data documentation and so forth. So thank you to the many people who've given guidance along the way. Thank you to the audience for listening. Please let me know if you have questions and if you're interested in joining the project. Thank you so much, Rosie. We're gonna switch over speakers now. Uh, so we're going to take questions at the end of this segment. Uh, we're going to take a second here and switch speakers. Um, Elizabeth Roke is going to come up. Uh, Elizabeth said I could describe her as an archivist who likes linked data, um, but a more thorough description is that she's the digital archivist and metadata specialist at the Rose Library at Emory University and works primarily with digitized and born digital assets from special collections. And she is indeed very interested in linked data approaches to description. Elizabeth, it looks like you're all set. So go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Marilee. And thank you to everybody um, for attending. Um, as everybody else, we had hoped to be in Texas in person, but I almost think this is better. Um, we're getting to hear more voices and more questions. So I am really excited about having the opportunity to talk about linked data and archives today. And I'm particularly pleased to follow Rosie's presentation um, because I think we're both trying to do similar things, um, though from a little bit of a different angle. As Marilee mentioned, I've been involved with linked data for several years. And while I've had a lot of opportunities to work on various ontologies, bringing that theoretical framework home to Emory has been more of a challenge and honestly is really the impetus for my continued engagement in this space. I wanna note that many of the ideas within um, this presentation were developed in collaboration with the Archives and Linked Data Interest Group. Um, that's an informal group of archivists that got together to solve linked data problems. While the members of this group are way too many to name here, um, I think our work enforces the idea that methodologies in linked data, much like the data itself, is best formulated in close collaboration with others. So my plan today is to spend about half my presentation on a theoretical framework for linked data and archives, and then I'm going to end with some real world practicalities. The formal definition of archives, endorsed by the Society of American Archivists, defines archives as materials preserved because they document evidence of the functions and responsibilities of their creator. In other words, a major component of archives is documenting and preserving context. One way we preserve that context is through detailed description of the collection and finding aids. So before we jump into how archival description benefits from linked data, I think it's instructive to first look at an example of what existing archival description looks like. So the Ruby Dandridge papers at Emory consists of about 13 boxes of correspondence, financial records, photographs, and sheet music. As with most archival collections, the history of how those materials came to be at Emory is complicated. Although Ruby Dandridge is listed as the creator and main entry for the collection, the scope note describes a much more complicated origin. The collection is not just a collection of materials created or collected by Ruby Dandridge. It also includes materials related to her daughters, Vivian and Dorothy, as well as her great nephew, Jimmy Mitchell. But that's not all. The finding aid also documents the transfer of the collection, its appraisal and processing. In this collection, there are nine different people, so nine agents, that each had a role in creating the collection that a researcher would see in our reading room. Maintaining the context of the collection, which is essential for establishing authenticity, um, so letting researchers know that it is what we say it is, requires documenting every single one of these relationships. Which brings us to the central point I wanna make. 
Archival description really is about documenting the relationships between people, records, and their activities, not the size of a collection or a listing of the contents of each box, though those are important elements for researchers too. The DAX archival content standard emphasizes this point in its statement of principles. Records, agents, activities, and the relationships between them are the four fundamental concepts that constitute archival description. And this is what linked data excels at doing and why linked data is such a natural fit for archives. As defined by W3C, the semantic web is not just about access to machine readable data, but it's also about access to the relationships between that data. Linked data provides a structure that relates one piece of information to another through defined relationships, which creates this web of interlinked data, so linked data. <clears throat> so what would this look like for archives? This diagram only models some of the relationships in the Dandridge papers, but it demonstrates, I hope, the potential of linked data for archives. It's conceptual. It's not based on any particular ontology. I sat down and put it together and tried to figure out and untangle all the relationships documented in the finding aid. But I think it shows how linked data can capture complex relationships well and in a different sort of visual sense. For instance, Laureen May Mitchell, so she's listed at the bottom of this slide, um, she was the widow of Jimmy Mitchell, and she didn't technically own the collection and is legally not the donor of the collection, but she's the person who packed it and shipped it. And so she certainly had an impact on the selection of items that would become the Ruby Dandridge papers and needs to be documented. Unlike paper finding aids or EAD, which at best records strings of human readable text, linked data dynamically connects agents and records to each other through specific relationships like creator, curator, archivist, donor, which builds extensible networks of people, places, events, and records that capture the entire provenance of a collection and how it has changed over time. If archival description is all about documenting relationships, then linked data is a natural fit for encoding them. And there's a couple of linked data models that are being developed specifically for archives. Two of the most significant are the ARM bib frame extension, which I'm going to be talking about in our next session today, and the records in context ontology being developed by the International Council on Archives. So this is simple, right? We'll just come up with the right ontological structures and transform our EAD and paper-based data into them. But as we all know, there's lots more to this. You also need archivists that understand how to apply the ontology interfaces to record the data, databases to store it, and discovery systems to expose it. And with linked data, most of us just aren't there yet. But a point that I often think is forgotten is that linked data was primarily designed to exchange and share data with others, not create a new model for local databases or the data within them. A functional triple store is not required for publishing linked data and engaging in the linked data ecosystem. And I want to suggest that linked data can't model local data or that we shouldn't be working on these sorts of problems, but rather that a new infrastructure shouldn't be a prerequisite for institutions to create and engage in linked data. If linked data is to be as transformative as proponents have argued for, it has to be accessible to more than just the institutions with significant resources and the staff expertise to design and implement complex data models a more pragmatic approach to linked data must be identified. What I mean to suggest here is that instead of assuming that linked data is the ideal solution we're all striving for, we should instead consider linked data as one solution among many. This frees us to be able to consider the core use cases for linked data, so what linked data does better than what we currently can do, and pursue individual practical solutions specifically to address those needs rather than trying to remodel and redesign all of our metadata and systems at once. Pragmatic linked data strives for good enough, not perfection. It reimagines and repurposes existing platforms that we're already using, like archive space and EAD repositories, and does not necessarily require building new ones, asking the question, what tools are already out there that we can use? This also extends to ontology building and reusing existing vocabularies and ontologies whenever possible, rather than recreating new ones. 
Pragmatic link data recognizes that innovation should be balanced with current resources, meaning that the labor impact on current staff must be taken into account. And most importantly, it focuses on real world use cases that have the greatest impact to end users, such as discovery, sharing data outside of library systems, community sourcing, and adding marginalized voices to knowledge systems. <clears throat> A few years ago, a group of archivists, many of us frustrated with our inability to engage with linked data due to local resource limitations, began exploring this concept of pragmatic linked data, considering what we can do with what we have and discovering together the strengths and limitations of linked data for archival description. Our first project looked at schema.org, an ontology that can embed linked data within web pages for better discovery. And that project resulted in a new extension to schema that supports properties for archival metadata. Many of you may have heard um, us talk about this at SAA in previous years. OCLC's archives grid and the archive space public user interface are both making use of this extension and they now embed schema.org metadata behind their web pages. This project did require some ontology development and resulted in the publication of linked data, but rather than going out on our own, we engaged with the schema community to enhance an existing ontology rather than design a brand new one. We reworked existing systems to output linked data rather than designing a whole new system. Most recently, we've been experimenting using this same pragmatic approach with Wikidata as a way for archival institutions to begin creating and working with linked data without needing to build a new platform, instead using Wikidata as a ready-made interface. A primary focus of this project is exploring how archival descriptive standards could be implemented in Wikidata. We use DAX elements as a starting point and mapped agent, repository, and collection elements to Wikidata properties. We propose new properties only when it was absolutely needed. <clears throat> Sometimes this resulted in using more generic properties for archival concepts, such as restrictions, or even leaving data out altogether but we were very conscious of trying to work within the structure that already existed, rather than trying to rebuild it to suit our own specific needs. I should note here that we specifically focused on using Wikidata rather than a Wikibase instance, as was done in OCLC's project Passage. While Wikibase provides similar platform benefits, we wanted to explore the impact of fully participating in external systems rather than library controlled ones. This work brings up some fundamental questions. How well does archival metadata translate into another description that wasn't designed for us? Do we gain anything through creating new properties such as scope note? Or is the concept of a scope note a relic of unstructured metadata systems and standards? What do we lose by adopting Wikidata? These initial mapping efforts have resulted in a mapping for almost all DAX elements into Wikidata. The elements that didn't map as well, such as system of arrangement or publication note, are mostly optional free text note elements designed for human consumption, bringing into question whether they are even needed in a linked data-based description that connects resources together through relationships rather than textual descriptive notes. We're not the first to grapple with these questions. Adding archival metadata to Wikidata is not a novel concept, and there are already metadata, there's already metadata about archival collections within Wikidata. An earlier Wiki project does the same for some international standards like ISAR CPF and ISAD-G. We will be adding our DAX mapping to this project over time, but we've also created a Wikidata project to document our standards-based work with DAX. The project page in Wikidata um, includes the full mappings from DAX to Wikidata, as well as examples of encoding and practical guidance for institutions wanting to add collections and agents and their repositories to Wikidata. Archival institutions engaged in Wikidata generally have used two methods for linking their library data. The first is the archives at property that relates a person or organization to the archival repository that holds their archives. Note the addition of the reference URL containing a direct link to the local finding aid. We use PID links at Emory. I ran a quick query in Wikidata a few days ago. 
and found that the Archives app property appears on 35,948 different items, which represents data from about 4,000 institutions. Many of these are national libraries, which you can see pretty much on this slide, though several are in individual institutions like Emory. A second approach some are taking is adding an external identifier. External identifiers are basically pointers to other systems. International identifiers such as LCNAF, BIAF, and SNAC are represented here, as well as identifiers for local systems, such as the Carnegie Hall identifier circled here. Currently, there are about 1,300 different types of external identifiers in Wikidata, and you can add your own to connect entities in your local database to Wikidata. Um, Emory has not done this yet, but it certainly would be a possibility. So what does this work look like in practice? Recently, my home institution, so Emory University, embarked on a project to begin adding collection data to Wikidata and Wikipedia. Our goal was to improve discovery and begin experimenting with linked data. But in all honesty, the COVID-19 crisis was really the impetus for this project because we needed a work at home project for our student employees. I began the project by creating a Wikidata entry for our library, the Stuart A. Rose Library at Emory University, and generating a set of instructions. Students were given a list of all of our finding aids and were asked to search Wikidata for collection creators. If they found an existing entry, they added an archives app property to link that person back to the Rose Library, essentially declaring that that person's archives existed. For names that didn't exist, students created a new entry using data from the bio and scope note in the finding aid. Students also added a link to the finding aid in Wikipedia pages if they existed. By the end of the project, which took three months, we created 579 new entities in Wikidata and, entered and added the archives app property for many more, resulting in 86% coverage of all of our archival collections that are now represented in Wikidata. The simplicity of the Wikidata user interface was relatively easy for students to begin working with it. They didn't have to understand JSON, Turtle, or RDF at all. They didn't even really have to understand what linked data is. Because Wikidata allows searching for properties, the most they had to do was identify the type of information they had, find a property, and enter the correct value. Since we were using the finding aid as our main data source, they encoded that as a reference for most properties. And here's a list of some of the properties we used. While we did encourage students to add more detail if they wanted, this project specifically was focused on creating that initial archives at link to connect people and organizations to their collections at the Rose Library. I am particularly interested to see if the Wikidata community will continue to enhance what we've created over time, which will potentially inform conversations that consider whether library authority data can exist well in community-based systems. And these properties are not the only possibilities. They're what worked for us in this project, but Wikidata contains almost 8,000 properties and counting. Our entities are admittedly limited in scope, but we're already seeing benefits from creating the data that we did create. In the Google Analytics data for our website and finding aids database, we're seeing that people are at least connecting to this new information. Compared with last year, we've seen a 62% bump in referral traffic in our finding aids database, 80% of which are new users. And Google is adding the information we've created in Wikidata to their knowledge graphs. Google uses Wikidata as the database for generating what are called knowledge panels. These are the boxes that sometimes appear to the right of search results that contain summary information for a given query. While Google doesn't disclose exactly how it generates these knowledge graphs, we do know that new entities we created in Wikidata now generate knowledge panels. Repository information is not included in the knowledge panel that Google displays, but our Wikidata entries have improved search engine ranking for our finding aids overall and increased discoverability of the people and organizations we document. So some basic principles if you're interested in getting started on a Wikidata project with archives. First, make sure it's worth doing the work. This isn't suggesting that there's some sort of notability standard you have to meet, but rather asking yourself if the entity you're creating enhances the data in Wikidata. 
At Emory, we have a lot of Civil War soldiers that we chose to skip. Check the restrictions. If you have a closed collection, you will not want to create an entity in Wikidata, which will increase discoverability of that collection and potentially leave your reference staff to answer a bunch of emails about it. Think about the ethical implications of adding someone to Wikidata and the information you're adding. This goes for any metadata, of course, but the increased visibility of Wikidata in search engines makes this particularly important here. I've included a couple of resources on the slide that are helpful, and of course, there's many, many others. For families, we didn't create a Wikidata entry for the family, but focused on individuals in the family and linked them together, much like we do when we create a main entry in Mark Catalog records. Watch out for split collections. If you don't hold the bulk of a collection, search for the repository that does, and then add a reference to that collection. And finally, remember that the finding aid is probably the best source of information for creating your Wikidata entries. As I was writing this presentation, I worried that it was too simple, but then I realized that is precisely the point I want to make. A few years ago, the Society of American Archivists had an initiative called Jump In to encourage archivists to begin working with their born digital collections. Just like with linked data, there were no definitive solutions but local engagement with collections and just trying things out. It resulted in more initiative, research, and guidelines for working with born digital materials, even in small under-resourced institutions. I humbly suggest the archives community should do the same with linked data. While there are important steps being made in BibFrame, the LD4 project, and even this conference, everyone should be engaging with linked data however it serves their needs and their users best whether it be discovery, adding missing data to knowledge ecosystems through interfaces such as Wikidata, or simply encouraging learning among archivists. Engaging in linked data doesn't have to be a massive undertaking. Linked data isn't just for data scientists and computer scientists. Linked data is not a singular problem to be solved or an application to be built. It is an ethos that rejects monolithic structures and instead encourages flexibility and multiple creative solutions for different communities and use cases. I encourage you to identify yours. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thanks also to Rosie. Um, we have a, a few minutes for Q&A before we break. Um, I'm only seeing, uh, and I invite you uh, to give a hand to a virtual hand to our speakers. We have a variety of hands for you to to choose from. Um, here is a question that I think could be for, uh, for either Rosie or for um, Elizabeth. In other linked pre data presentations, um, there have been discussions about assuming the gender of a person. Have you come across an author where you were conflicted about their gender and how did you handle it? Well, I'll go ahead and answer it from um, my point of view. Um, I have not found an issue with it at all in terms of this um, special collection. These, um, I've used the data as I found it from Northeastern University and most of the authors are classified as women and a couple of them are men uh, where they were uh, co-authors, if back in that day that wasn't accurate and perhaps the person was non-binary or, or something else, we don't know about it today and so we haven't used it. So I, I didn't otherwise have any issues that I had to um, resolve myself. Elizabeth, what about you? Had, has this come yeah, up for the I, creators? I, yeah, I think my answer to this is going to be a bit of a cop-out um, by saying that because we use the finding aid as our major source of data, um, whatever was decided there, we encoded. Um, so there are discussions um, at Emory um, about diversity and gender and um, accurately representing the people in our collections. So. Um, Probably we will be changing some of that information and we'll change it in Wikidata as well, but we're really trying to stay parallel. If we made it discoverable in one place, we did the same in Wikidata. 
Thank you. There was a question that because I'm um, I'm not adept with Zoom, I um, I inadvertently marked as answered, but I think that you two could have some um, input on this as well. Uh, what are batch methodologies for adding references to statements within items? Uh, Jackie, she referenced quick statements um, as an example, but just wondering about other tools and methodologies that you guys use for batch um, for batch entering data to speed things up. I've used, um, we didn't in the project that I described here because I really wanted students to have their hands on the data and really be thinking about what they're encoding. Um, but I have used um, the plugin that exists in OpenRefine um, to be able to add um, and reconcile and add statements over to Wikidata. Um, I'll also note that on the um, Wiki project that um, the Archives and Linked Data Interest Group created, um, there are some um, tools and links to documentation that you can use. Um, so Quick Statements is one of those um, cradles on there. Um, so there's some resources there. Uh, the answer is very similar. Yes, Quick Statements, um, though I'm not really a super user with that. And yes, to open a find, though I am completely um, baffled about how to use Open Refine, and I've had to rely on others to do that for me. Um, so I guess that covers it. Okay, great. Um, do either did either of you, Rosie? I think you you referenced this, so you might talk a little bit more about in depth. And Elizabeth, I don't know about you. Did either of you engage in property creation in Wikidata? And if so, what was your experience with the workflow associated with property creation? And I think some of this is what are the mechanics behind property creation? How do you, um, how do you get uh, input and feedback and um, confirmation from the community about that? Uh, just share a little, a little about your experiences with that. Sure, I'd be glad to. That was part of my learning experience because I needed, a, or at least I thought I needed a new property and that would be the property that would link the review that had been done in 1800 with the evaluation that was done in um, 2010. And that review of property appear to me to be missing. But I thought, you know, maybe it's called something else. And so not being certain, I turned to Will Kent, who's a Wikidata specialist at um, the Wiki Education Foundation. And he helped me with creating a property proposal because he too couldn't find exactly what I thought that I needed for this. Um, I pinged people who were part of the um, Wiki Project Books um, group, and they started almost immediately giving me some feedback. Um, they asked me for examples of how I'd use it and so forth, and I found them to be very courteous and professionals, professional in how they um, um, interacted with me. I felt like I knew far less than many of them did about um, Wikidata in general. I'm not a, um, a programmer or developer, but they kind of helped me with what I needed to be able to articulate so that in the end, it was approved. Um, the whole process took maybe, I'd have to go back and look to be accurate, but I'd say something like five or six weeks. Yeah, and I'll just say briefly, there were a couple properties that were um, proposed for archives. The majority of that work was done by a Wikipedian that was part of our group, so I wasn't directly involved in that. But I will say um, that for those who have, and I was one of these people, um, are kind of scared of the Wikidata community, it is incredibly welcoming. And when you put comments on pages or propose things, you will have people chiming in and trying to help you support that and talk you through arguments. Um, so it's, I, I want to make the point to not scare people off in this community because it's, it's a really great space to be engaged in. Super. Um, here's a question that I think is primarily for Elizabeth. Do you see a future where collections would primarily be cataloged in external systems like Wikidata instead of internal systems like local finding aids? 
or will internal systems remain as important as they are now with data replicated in external systems? I think that's a really good and really interesting question. Um, and I can only give an opinion on it. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but uh, I think we will continue to ma maintain our local systems. I mean, that's kind of how linked data has to work anyway. Um, project passage in how they worked between Wikibase and Wikidata has some lessons um, about this question. Um, but I am very conscious that there is data that we have that we can't release to the public. We have some that needs to be discoverable um, and we put it in Wikidata to make it more so. But ideally what would happen is we would have some kind of an ecosystem that we build, not a system to rule them all, that continues to communicate back and forth and you put the most appropriate information in the most appropriate place. Um, not to um, go on too long, but one of the things that I'm really interested in is um, people and organization data is one of the things, authority, this sort of authority data that I actually think belongs in other systems. Um, I really don't like the responsibility of controlling somebody's identity, and I would rather that existed outside of libraries, but there needs to be experimentation as to how that really would work and how we would prevent harm to those people that we're exposing. Thank you. Um, and another question for Elizabeth and, and maybe also for Rosie. Um, how do you uh, plan to monitor? So you're, you're creating information and you said you were interested to see kind of what updates there are to those. Um, so what mechanisms do you have to monitor those Wikidata entries for updates uh, with what frequency uh, and what subsequent edits would make you lose confidence in Wikidata as a community uh, built data repository? Yeah, I'll speak to the, to the um, Emory point and then let Rosie kind of um, chime in on this one. Um, I am monitoring it mostly through Sparkle queries. Um, I've got a couple of Sparkle queries that, that I'm running to pull data. Um, it's one of the things that I really like about having our information in Wikidata is I can query it in a very simple way, easier than using um, XML tools um, for our EAD or using the API um, in archive space. Um, so I plan to monitor it that way. Um, I don't know what edits would make me lose confidence. Um, I think what's going to be most interesting is to watch the difference between our prominent donors, um, so an Alice Walker or Salman Rushdie, and watch the edits on those pages versus the edits on less prominent people and see if they're touched at all. Um, I use Sparkle queries too and this query to kind of keep an eye on things. Um, but I think I'm not going to ever lose confidence in Wikidata. I really do believe that this is kind of the, the right way, the right path. And I think that if people want to make edits to these items that includes additional data or different data than um, is held in the collection at Northeastern University, then they should, you know, go have at it. There are other people who are looking, keeping an eye probably on um, many of these items. And if, if there was an act of vandalism, then I suppose if I miss that, if I don't see that, if someone changes that the academic um, evaluation was changed from very positive to very ne negative. Well, somebody does need to make sure that that doesn't happen, but I haven't seen anything like this yet. And I'm hopeful that no one would make those kinds of changes. Um, I guess it remains to be seen. Um, the data set I'm working with is, relates to pretty obscure things. I mean, the authors, are not necessarily that obscure, but they're really not um, well known by everyone out there. And when we talk about the periodicals and the actual reviews and such, um, we're talking about obscure topics. So in its own way, kind of lucky that I don't expect much um, vandalism. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Here is a question for um, 
Elizabeth, but again, also perhaps for, for Rosie, curious about the mechanics of how students were trained and performed the work. So were specific people tasked with dealing with a single property, finding aid, et cetera? And I think that this is, you know, an overall question is how do we do, um, how do you gradually introduce people to Wikidata and let them kind of gain confidence within kind of narrow lanes, high bumpers, and then kind of take the bumpers off and then widen those lanes and give them a little more autonomy for, for being able to make additional um, contributions. Yeah, I think the biggest hurdle for our students, um, as it was for me when I first engaged in this space, was making your first edit and being confident enough to actually hit publish the first time. Um, so students were given a spreadsheet that had all the finding aids listed um, and assigned themselves a finding aid. Um, mostly these were graduate students, though there were some undergrads that were involved with this. Um, so they would assign themselves um, a finding aid, and we started by kind of doing a fast pass um, through the entire list to find the ones where entities existed, and all they needed to do was add that single archives at property. And once they had done that, that gave them some confidence of creating properties and understanding how the interface worked and made the creation um, of the um, other information a lot easier. Um, as far as training goes, it, because it had to be virtual, um, we had a webinar that we did where I walked people through it. But honestly, it was just um, questions that went back and forth. And really, I didn't get a lot. Um, students seemed to be able to do this fairly simply. I took to Wikidata like a fish to water. And I've been a Wikidatan since 2013. Um, I would be delighted to work with some students and I have certain tasks that I think would be a good entry into um, Wikidata. And so if anyone um, is working with a group of students out there and doesn't quite know what to do with them at some point, I'd be glad to um, engage with them and um, have them work on a couple of different specific tasks. Super. This is, this is great. Um, so Kate Bowers has a question that I am going to interpret. Um, I'm going to do a little interpretive dance here, Kate, and please forgive me if I get this, if I get this wrong. Um, so her comment is that Wikidata, there, there's a lot of properties in Wikidata. So where, when you're, um, when you're faced with Kind of a giant array of possible properties where do you place because you could see this as a task where you're just endlessly filling out properties for per, you know potential properties for a person or something how do you uh structure this so that you're you're receiving your both um uh you're you're getting the most value out of it and also contributing the most to the community well, how do, you, how do you aim your, yeah, how do you aim yourselves? So, um, I work in two ways. One is I like to take a look at something that is similar and then see if I can replicate that. No sense in reinventing the wheel if there's already a good way of doing it. And that includes selecting what the, um, best choice and properties might be for a specific subject, call it an author, a periodical, or what have you. So that's thing number one, and it's also my process on Wikipedia. I take a look at others that are in the similar category and try to structure what I'm gonna create as a Wikipedia article by taking a look at what others have already done. But thing number two is talk to people. You know, learn who is um, involved in the Wikidata community and ask for help. I'm really good about asking for help in general in life, asking for directions um, if I'm lost. And so for me, this is easy, maybe not so easy for others, or maybe you don't know where to start or you don't know anyone in the Wikidata community, but surely, you know, somebody who knows somebody and you'll find that the Wikidata Wikidatans are really quick to want to help. There's a Wikidata Telegram channel that's really active 24 hours a day. Some really good people who know things and are kind and uh, willing to help. 
And I'm going to give a bit of a pragmatic answer to this question that may be unsatisfying, but really, um, for me, I think it goes back to use cases in determining what ontology you're using or what system you're using. So you're right, schema doesn't do a lot, but schema is really designed to facilitate discovery and Wikidata is trying to do something different. Um, so in the, the project that I described um, at Emory, because we were taking a pragmatic approach, we identified which elements we thought we'd get the most bang for our buck. Um, and didn't try to describe the entire universe, but just the universe that helped us with a very specific way for people to do discovery. Um, we certainly could have added thousands of properties um, to these entries. Um, and I think um, archives struggle with this all the time. And we may be particularly well suited to these sorts of decisions because we're so used to aggregate description where you can't describe everything, you just describe what's relevant. Great. So you uh, guys have perfect timing. We are ready for our next break. So I want to thank you guys uh, once again uh, for, um, for doing such a great job. Uh, we, you see that you have many hands here. We have people who've given many hands to our, to our speakers. Um, so thank you guys so much.